Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon where you are. Welcome. Thanks for taking the time today to join us in a, I'll call it action-packed, 30 minutes, which will probably turn out to be 40 to 45. So uh, let's get started. I'm assuming that everyone can hear me because I'm not seeing any questions that say I can't hear you. So we'll assume that your volume is fine and you're able to uh, get your handouts, which are on the uh, control panel under handouts, one of five. And uh, we'll probably end up making available some others as we move forward. Today, brought to you by Market US and Custom Keynotes. Eileen Kent, the federal sales Sherpa. We've talked about this particular presentation many, many times and finally decided to get on and bring other people in and help them also. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the federal sales Sherpa. I love that name, by the way, and I have for the past four to five years. Eileen Kent and Eileen, let's take it away. And hopefully I don't miss a cue on the slides. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me today. Hello, everyone. My name is Eileen Kent. And the next 10 slides, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're just going to hit the don't do's really hard and then the second part of this presentation will dig in a little bit deeper because you'll be looking at some of these don't do it's and you're going to say but 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 and we're going to talk a little bit more about it a little bit later but the one thing a couple of these things my goal for you is my hope for you is that we are going to save you time money and face in this industry. If we don't have a good reputation in this industry, then it's going to be very difficult to get repeat and referral business with the federal customers because they're extremely picky about who they do business with. So we want to be able to um, save you some money and some time and also keep you from getting into any uh, maybe social media trouble and possibly some issues that uh, might take uh, you out of the game. So the first thing I want to talk about is something that a lot of people, when they're first registered at SAM, they um, first get on SAM or they are approached by someone who is enticing them to sell to the federal government and they're offering their services for sale to register you at the System for Award Management uh, system, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But you do not have to pay for that. It's free. Free. So also, if you ever had to update your entity, because you're going to have to do that each year, you're going to have to tweak a little bit of information now and then, you should not be paying anybody to do that for you. The next thing is a whole can of worms I could open up right now, but do not write bids blindly and what I what do I mean by that is you're gonna go to federal you know FBO Fed Biz Ops and look up an opportunity and you're gonna read yourself into it it's almost like uh, you know looking at cast and call for a type and you think I'm perfect for this and what we're gonna try to encourage you not to do is to blind bid and spend a lot of time and money on proposals that really you have no business spending even five minutes on. So we'll talk further about this, but no more blind bidding. So the next thing is we don't want you to sit on your certifications. What do we mean by that? Is if you have a small business, woman-owned business, economic disadvantaged woman-owned business, veteran-owned business, service-disabled veteran, you, you're a DOT um, certified company, you're a hub zone. If you've got your certifications and you're in system for award management and you think you got it going on that the government's going to start calling you, well, it's never going to happen. You might get lucky with a call or two, but most of the time it's vendors and people soliciting their business with you. So you really don't want to sit on your search. You want to run with them in your hand and talk to as many people as possible. 
So the next thing, and, and Mike and I are kind of go back and forth about this one because Mike, you know, sells GSA consulting services. He's available to you. And we'll talk further about this later in this program. But I don't want you to get a GSA schedule if the customers that you're approaching that are buying what you sell don't use schedules to buy what you sell. It doesn't make sense. So we're going to talk a little further about this later, but this is a crucial issue. Don't get a GSA schedule unless you know for sure your customers use it to buy what you sell. Don't partner with a company just because they're a name brand or just because they have certain certifications. You're gonna to wanna to do a lot more homework regarding who you're gonna team with and partner with, especially if you are looking for a mentor as a mentor protege. As a mentor protege, you only get to team as a mentor protege to a mentor with one company. It's like getting married. You do not wanna dive in with someone who's just gonna put your name on a slide and walk you around and say, this is my protege, but you never get any business. So we really want to be picky about who we partner with. The next issue is there's a lot of great companies out there. And again, we're going to talk further about this in a little bit. There are a lot of people to work with and a lot of people that are very generous with their capabilities and their services and their consulting services. But we really want to encourage you to do a complete and thorough background check and also never just rely on one person's opinion. We want you to get a handful of opinions and a handful of references and ask around the industry to see if the person that you're working with is legit. And again, we'll talk a little further about that in a few minutes. Also, a lot of companies really love the idea that if they lose, they can always protest a loss. And how is this going to win friends and influence people? So it takes a lot of time and energy to protest. And a lot of us are just too small and we don't have the, you know, unlimited amount of funds to protest a loss. So, um, and we'll have a few unlesses in there, but in general, we want you to avoid getting into the whole protesting game. A lot of companies that are small um, get approached by customers and small companies that are working as a subcontractor on site. And the customers inside might come up to you and say, hey, you know, it cost me a lot less money if you got your own contract with us and you started working with us directly. And we suggest highly that you be very careful about that. We believe that if you go around primes on the sites that you're working on, that is not going to work well for you in the long run. You really want to take anything that happens on site with a customer, if you're a sub, you should take it to your prime. If you want to sell to the federal government, sell to other agencies. But don't go around primes behind their back and start working with their clients. It's just not a very good practice. Some people do it, but that doesn't mean they're good people to work with. Also, this is a hard one. Don't talk politics, ever. No jokes, no sidebar comments, nothing. So we highly recommend that you do never speak politics. Don't hide a problem from a federal customer. And we'll talk further about this, but this is critically important. If you're going to deliver nine things out of ten, and you make a promise that it's going to be there on a certain day, you need to have a conversation with your client about the shortcomings of what's happening or whatever problem you're running into. You need to have a conversation with your client. So what are things that you should be doing? And I'm really excited about talking about this in detail with you today. And in terms of managing your SAM.gov registration, a lot of companies leave that SAM.gov registration to a consultant. And let me tell you, 
You have procurement technical assistance centers in every state. They're grantees. The government pays for them. They get grant money from the state government and their local <laughs> DOD bases, and they are there to support you and help you get your SAM registration up and running, up to date, working properly, and that is a complimentary service to you. So they're experts at SAM. So I never, I give some recommendations on what people can do to upgrade their SAM a little bit, but I never touch their SAM record. No one should be touching your SAM record, but you, you need to own it. So if you need to keep your entity active every year, it, it can become inactive. And I would suggest that you alarm yourself on your phone and maybe update it either every quarter or every um, half a year. Because if customers are looking to do business with you, they don't want to see that your activity, you're active until just next month. They want to see that you've got some time out there. Also, they, when they search for you, they can choose a company based on uh, how recently they've activated. They could say, you know, active for six months out. So they can choose you. So you want to keep that up to date if you can. And also, you also want to make sure that whatever NAICS codes your customers are using to buy what you sell, you need to make sure that's in your SAM record as well as uh, product service codes. So you need to be able to be very flexible and able to dive into your SAM. Know it like the back of your hand. It's not that difficult to use. And then when you're in your SAM record, make sure you tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Don't mess around with uh, playing games in SAM because this is a place where the government is looking to do business with you. It says if, for example, um, if you were pulled over by a police officer, they would ask you for your license and then they would take your license and look you up in a database. This is your license in the database and you need to keep this up to date at all times with the truth out there. Write only winners. You know, this is a little piece of our building blocks of winning proposal that Mike and I are going to be doing in about a week. Um, but this is a strategy that most of the strongest proposal teams use before they write a proposal. They actually sit down and they ask themselves a series of at least 20 questions of whether or not, A, we knew the customer, the customer knows us, we knew it was coming, um, who wrote the scope of work? Did we write it for them? Did somebody write it inside? Did they ask us for a little bit of a, an idea of what the scope would look like for a budget? Did we help them budget it? Who's the incumbent? What's the contract vehicle? What's the set aside? Do we fit those or do we need a teaming partner to do that? Do we have a strong win theme, which means do we have a unique factor that they know about and they're asking for that's unique about us within this proposal? Um, and if we're going to do it, it's got to be letter perfect. If we can't get it, you can't just slap something together and throw it in there thinking you're going to get your foot in the door. Because personally, I would rather you fly to them on a Southwest airline flight and put your foot in their door. Because going through an entire proposal effort, I call it the ringing the dinner bell. You know, once you get everybody excited about a proposal effort, everyone's going to be working evenings and weekends on this thing. They're going to be not only putting in a lot of hours with you on this, they're going to be using their family time and their personal time to help you get it done on time so you don't want to ring the dinner bell unless you know it's a winner or you have a really good chance they know who you are you've been focused on them you knew it was coming and otherwise it's going to be a blind bid you knew nothing about it and you're spending all this time and energy on a file filler just to get your foot in the door when you could have easily just picked up the phone and gotten your foot in the door so only write winners that's the goal here that can save you the bid no bid process can save you many, many hours and thousands and thousands of dollars. Things that you need to do. You need to hit the field and start calling and talking to people who buy what you sell. So you need to train your team how to sell. You need to train your on-site team who's maybe butts and seats you're putting on a, on a project. You need to teach them how to pay attention to modifications, opportunity, pain, because they're looking at opportunities that are right in front of them while they're focused on your project. You also need to perform a deep dive competitive analysis. The data is out there. And if you can't do it, there's consultants out there that can help you with that. 
Um, they could do a deep dive competitive analysis for you, looking at who buys what you sell from whom. They can do it based on keyword searches, NAICS code, the area that you're in. They can look at your competitor's contracts and they can pretty much see every data element for every contract in the business that's close to what you do. So then what they can do is then build an action plan for you around those agencies who buy what you sell. Wait a and minute. And then you can go after it. Wait a minute. This sounds an awful lot like the three-step program. Oh, are you talking about my three-step program that I offer to companies one-on-one? -on -one? Correct. Yes. This is something where I, I am an expert in. I do a three-step program. It's three two-and-a-half-hour teleseminars that's customized for you and your team. Federal sales game is the first one. A competitive analysis is second. And then an action plan around the agencies that buy what you sell. But even if you don't hire me, you need to have it done. So if you do it, that's great. So we need to do our homework. The next thing is that homework will determine whether or not you truly need a GSA schedule. And a GSA schedule, GSA expects you to sell 25,000 in the first 24 months of your contract vehicle. And then after that, 25,000 a year. The reason why is they're, connect, they're collecting a little fee from you, a little bit less than 1% for every deal, and they're making money. So for example, um, the GSA has sold up to 40 million a year and that's about 270 million they collect from vendors as a result of selling through GSA schedules. So they like vendors who are able to sell through the schedule and pay them. So the concept here is once you get your GSA schedule, you need to, and even before you get your GSA schedule, you need to hit the ground running, develop relationships with your customers and use that GSA schedule as a bridge to quickly and quietly close under the radar deals. Quickly define and quietly under, close under, under the, the radar. radar. Under the radar deals could be either A, if you're a products company and they just click and buy on GSA Advantage, they can buy things up to 25,000 off of GSA Advantage if it's a product. If it's a service, they need to get um, the price list of two others up to 25,000. And if it's over 25,000 for either products or services, they need at least three written bids for their file. So they can either publish it through GSA's eBuy or they can ask three companies that are similar in size and scope on a project to provide them with bids. And hopefully you're one of them because you're one of their custom companies that have been calling on them and you get this under the radar opportunity, only three bids, it's done within 14 days instead of the 269 days it usually takes on Fed biz apps. So having a GSA schedule makes it faster quicker, less expensive, and under the radar opportunities. But also, always when we're on GSA schedule, we need to know who buys on GSA schedule what we sell, so we focus on those agencies first. You know, the beauty of uh, the schedule buy that you were just discussing, it's not protestable. Because it's an order, not a competition. So if you give me an order as an agency, uh, Susie Cream Cheese can't turn around tomorrow and say, I, I protest this. Well, because there was no competition and there was nobody aggrieved. So very important point as far as keeping everything under the radar. And if it's over 25,000, it will probably get reported to Federal Procurement Data Center, which I believe only reports 25 and above, unless that's changed because, you know, they change everything daily as far as uh, what who reports what, when, and where, to who. So, but very, very important to stay under the radar and uh, be successful. In terms of federal procurement data system, the rules are 25,000 and over is reported there, but we are able to see a lot more transactions. So people do use it quite a bit. It's, you know, we don't see everything, but we see enough to be able to point you in the right direction on who buys what you sell. So it's a great site to go to. Okay, next slide. Please. So uh, partner with primes who are winning at the agencies who buy what you sell. So if you're going to go after a teaming partner and you want to team with them and work with them, you really want to work with a company that's already inside the agency that you're focusing your time on. So for example, if you were selling IT to Homeland Security, the big, um, the big companies that they've been using a lot, they use GSA schedules. They have their own internal um, Eagle 2 contract vehicle. 
Um, but most recently, they started talking about using GSA's GWAC Oasis. So not only do you want to go after Homeland Security if you are in, e um, in IT, you would be going after the vendors that are on GSA Schedule IT70, the vendors that are on Eagle 2, the vendors that are on Oasis, and also they're using um, Department of Health and Human Services, CIO SB3. So you want to team with companies that have bridges to Homeland Security quickly, but you only want to create relationships with a handful of them, and then you have this superstar, I call them super teams, that you have quick bridges to work with the agencies. But you only want to work with primes that know what they're doing. You want to spend your some really quality time getting to know them and only companies that have bridges to them and relationships to them. Otherwise, go in yourself and be the prime yourself. When hiring a consultant, I have a saying, ask around. There are good consultants and there are great consultants out there. Mike and I worked together on a, on a complimentary webinar like this today, and we passed business to each other without um, paying each other commissions. Did you know that? We do it because we both believe in what each other offers, and we do it because we've been doing it for quite a while. Mike has sent many of his clients to go through the three-step, and then I've had three-steppers that needed GSA schedules that have worked with Mike. So, We've referred business to each other just because it's the right thing to do. And I highly recommend that when you do your background checks, don't lean on everything on one thing you read on the internet or one thing you hear from one person. Do a thorough background check. So for example, I had a client just last week that asked me for some references. So I provided him some references. And you know what, he was really kind. He followed up with me the next day and said, hey Eileen, um, I reached out to your references and they haven't called me back yet. Now, I had already emailed my references letting him know that this customer was calling them. But then I called them and said, hey, this guy, this gentleman would like to speak with you if you don't mind um, talking to them about my reference. And they said, oh my gosh, Eileen, I am so busy selling right now <laughs> and doing such a good job selling, I didn't have a chance to call him back. But I will talk to him right away. And they did that day. So this particular gentleman could have easily said, Eileen, your references didn't call me back, and then wrote me on. But he didn't. He gave me a shot to call my references again. Hey, talk to this gentleman. He's And they, they profusely apologized and said, we were just slammed with orders, so we couldn't call you that morning. And really sorry. And then I gave him a couple of extra references just, just in case. So... The concept here is we highly recommend you ask around. Talk to people on LinkedIn that are in the business. Um, those of us who have been doing this a while know pretty much everybody. And if even if they're a, a competitor of mine, if they're a legitimate peer, I'm going to give you thumbs up on them. If they're doing good stuff, I'm going to say, hey, they know what they're doing. You're finding a good person. I'm not afraid to give a competitor a good reference. Next slide, please. So... As for a debriefing, now one of the things that Michael was talking about through GSA is um, it's not protestable. Also, I, in some cases, you can't ask for a debriefing, but you're going to always ask for a debriefing because most of the time you're going to get one when you lose. So if you write a proposal, ask if you can ask for a debriefing. And what they're going to do is they're going to set you up on a conference call or they're going to send you an email and give you some details. But the goal for that conference call is not to tell them or threaten a protest. What you're basically going to ask them is you're going to sell to them two more times. I'd love to be the backup vendor. Or is anything else coming down the pipeline? So I just have a quick story for the backup vendor. I lost a deal that was against my competitor because the deal came into me on a Thursday and they wanted the bids by Tuesday with delivery by Friday. So it was a seven day turnaround and they were asking for 100 workstations and workstations in furniture world is like Tinker Toys and they didn't even have a drawing yet. So I basically said to them, listen, you're asking for a proposal here, but I don't even have a space plan. They said, yeah, but your competitor says they can still deliver. So I provided them with the quote, and I basically said to them, I've got this uh, quote for you, but I'm telling you now that I cannot deliver unless I get a space plan, and then I'll be able to deliver within seven days of that space plan. So, of course, I lost, and they called me one more time. Eileen, please, can you do this? And I said, said, no, no one can if they don't have a drawing. And they, they said, well, I'm going to have to give it to the other vendor. And I asked for a debriefing. And they basically told me I was $8,000 less than my competitor. And then I came back with, listen, I will stand by behind my quote. 
if you have any trouble with this proposal or this delivery and it's a mess, I'll always be here for you. And guess what happened on a Saturday? They called me and said it's a big disaster and we will never use this other vendor again. And from now on, we're going to come to you, sole source, give you seven days notice in a space plan. And they were a long-term client of mine. So sometimes when you lose a battle, you win the war. So in a debriefing, here's another story regarding anything else coming down the pipeline. I knew a gentleman who lost a deal with the um, with Wright Patterson. It was a $50 million contract and it was an aerospace contract. And he was asked to come in for a debriefing. And they knew him personally because he used to work at Wright Patterson. And they basically showed him a piece of paper and said, the reason why you lost was this, was this one piece of paper on this 250 page bid. And the piece of paper was a flow chart. And one of his um, designers, one of his engineers put a joke in one of the bubbles. It said, <laughs> it was um, it was too expensive radar system never to be delivered on time or something. They did a joke in one of the bubbles and they said, we couldn't have given you this bid because of that, you know, and he just looked at them sheepishly and said, anything else coming down the pipeline? And everybody in the room burst out laughing and they handed him a $13 million contract. So his consolation prize from losing a 50 was a 13. And he asked them, can you do this? And they said, we just did. Any questions? And he's like, no. So always ask these two questions. Can I be the backup? Anything else coming down the pipeline? Also, in terms of your prime, when you're working on site, respect the agreement with the prime. I had someone recently working with Booz Allen and they were approached by the client and the client wanted to save some money and wanted them to go around Booz Allen. And I said to them, are you crazy? This is one client and you might get a tiny little deal here and there. But if you're doing well with Booz Allen, they're going to take you everywhere you go. If you bring this problem to Booz Allen and work it through with them. In fact, maybe they'll ask you to be the prime and they'll be the sub on the next contract. So Always be in open contact with your primes because they're in multiple locations. And if they realize you're bringing them business and opportunities and keeping them in the loop, they're going to bring you to other locations. If you want to sell directly to the federal government and sell around the primes, go to other agencies where they're not. Talking politics. I mean, no one's going to ever tell you that you slipped up and you hinted and showed your hands on your political views. They're just going to look at each other and go, this guy doesn't get it. This woman doesn't understand the business. Not even a joke, not even a cartoon, nothing. No, take the bumper stickers off your cars. You need to keep your politics very close to you when you're selling to the federal government because the administrations change all the time, but the federal employees don't. And that's who you're selling to. Next slide, please. And then in terms of uh, making sure that you let your customers know about problems, the best way to keep yourself out of trouble is under promise and over deliver every single time. Kind of like that situation where the government wanted me to deliver in less than seven days with no, deli with no designs. That's insane. I wasn't going to walk into that disaster. I knew my competitor was already packing the trucks and must have the drawings. So, you need to under promise and over deliver every single time. And if there's a problem, in fact, a project manager that knows me personally came up to me and said, tell your students, Eileen, the salespeople, the contractors out there, problems don't age well like fine wine. <laughs> they never do. Tell us what you're struggling with and maybe we can help you fix it. So bring the problem forward. Stop hiding them. Bring them forward and they'll help you with them. So here we are, exactly at the bottom of the hour, half an hour in. I think we're right on time. So I just want to throw it back to Michael. First of all, I want to thank everybody for joining me today and being part of this with me today. And I hope that maybe I saved you a little time, a little money, and a little reputation, your image. And if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to stick around. And I just want to thank you for having me today. And we also have a little special coming up after this Q&A session. So don't hang up. Hang in there. Anybody got a question? I'm sitting here and just not used to being quiet during a uh, half hour, hour uh, webinar series. But uh, here I am. Any questions at all for me, Eileen? Anything in general, not general, on topic, off topic, doesn't matter. 
let me see what I got here. I do have one. Well, we'll get by those other. Wait a minute. Got something coming in here now. Uh, I have a schedule with zero sales. Now what? Well, oh, I love that question. Eileen <clears throat> always one. says, don't do jokes. Well, I have to. I'm sorry. Two words. Run, Forrest. <laughs> Eileen, go ahead. I'll let you take it. Um, there's two things to consider. First of all, the big question is, is did you really need that schedule in the first place? I had a, a person that came to me and asked for the three step program and wanted to know I'm about to lose my schedule. I don't know what to do. And in our competitive analysis, we discovered her customer public building services here in Illinois. She was an HVAC company. She was a customer in Illinois. She asked, um, she was told by the project manager, at, G at GSA's public building services, do you have a GSA schedule? She said, no. He said, I can't talk to you unless I, you have one. So she spent two years. She went and got one. Two years went by, no sales. And then she asked me to do the analysis. And we discovered not one single HVAC contract in Illinois at the time. Not one was on a GSA schedule, including public building services in Region 5 in the Chicago office. They were using an 8A contractor, IDIQ, sole source. We've been using them for 10 years, and not any of the agencies were using it for HVAC. So basically what we decided to do was let her GSA schedule go, and then she teamed with some of those primes and working with them and, and is working as a small woman-owned business, got some past performance, and is doing some work with the federal government. Now, if you're at zero sales and they are buying on GSA schedule and you're getting that letter, there is a way to save your GSA schedule. Um, the way I do it is there's a letter that we write telling them where we understand we're at zero sales, that we're coming up to the 24 month point. We're committed to selling to the federal government. The first thing you're gonna do is tell them that you've hired a consultant to help you with the competitive analysis and action plan. You've decided to go after these four agencies with your GSA schedule in hand and that you're gonna market the GSA schedule to them. You're also gonna tell them how many bids that you did and responses that you did as RFQs on GSA's eBuy and also what you're gonna do in the next 12 months to make this happen. And you're gonna ask them, you know, this is how much time and money I invested in this schedule. This is how much time and money I'm investing in sales in the next year in activities. And please, please extend me one more year. So there is a letter that you could write and it could, um, it, you could save it, it could happen. Sometimes they'll go across the schedule and knock off like one year in 2014, they went across IT70 and just cut out a thousand vendors right off of IT70 at zero sales. So sometimes they do a blanket cut, um, but I think that if you're a small business and you have a compelling story and that you're showing them that you're doing everything you can, you can write a justifiable reason to stick around. Do you remember Earl when, uh, well, you didn't know, uh, you didn't know him in 2014. <clears throat> he called me on a Saturday and said, I just got a notice of intent to terminate contract for lack of sales. That's the dreaded eviction letter. And I responded to him and said, uh, I can help you. And he hired me. I got a copy of the letter, $51 in sales in two years. They had no clue what they were doing. I contacted the CEO. We talked for probably a half hour, got to know each other. Fortunately, we didn't have to write that letter. He verbally gave me six months. By the end of that year, and this was July, by the end of that year, which was what, six, seven months later, he had almost touched two million in sales. Now, don't say I'm a god, it's, it wasn't me. I just showed him where the trough was so he could eat and drink. The following year, it was three million, and may uh, may he rest in peace. Had he not uh, died, he probably would have been well over five million. So, it does work. The, the important thing is <clears throat> get Eileen in the beginning to get to step three. Once you've got that federal marketing plan, who's buying, what buying where they're buying it, 
name, address, city, state, zip, shoe size, everything, including email address. That's who you start talking to. Very, very uh, important piece of advice. When you email any government employee for the first time, never do an attachment. Ask permission to send an attachment. Now that attachment, if you go back to last week's or last webinar we did, would be your federal capability statement. You can watch all those videos on the website. And the important thing is never blindly send an attachment to a government employee. It's an insult and it's very rude. Hopefully uh, whoever answered that question or whoever asked it, uh, Hope that answered your question, kind of long and laborious, but it uh, we got it. Any other questions? Also, um, while you're while you're waiting for a question, um, Earl went through the three step with me, and uh, we worked with them uh, every week and coached them along the way. So sometimes um, we got to put some emphasis on your sales team to go out there and get the business. We can't sit and wait for the orders. We got to go get it, and and. Earl was significantly motivated to hit the field. He was probably one of the most um, dynamic field salespeople and on the phone I've ever met. So he hustled once he understood the game. Yeah, I just got a question. Where can I download the handouts from? I'm going to tell everybody, but I'm also going to send a message to everyone. Click on handouts in your control panel. Yeah, it's downloadable right there for you. It should say handouts, one of five. Done, done. Thanks for the question, Kristen. Any questions that like, did I hit a nerve about anything like no protests? Or tell me if I've hit a nerve and you're yes budding and you want to challenge, please ask a question because experience and stories really help drive these issues home. Um, I find that uh, from from what we hear in the marketplace for protests, for example, 10% um, of protests win, okay? That doesn't mean you win the contract. They're gonna rebid it and probably find another way to get it to the person that they originally awarded it to. So it's a lot of time and effort and money to protest something. So you're gonna wanna pick them wisely and be ready to never work with that agency again if you protest in some cases. Now, I had one situation where a client was told to protest because they weren't happy with who they awarded the contract to. So they actually asked the vendor to protest it. So sometimes there's some really unusual reasons to do it, but in many cases, um, I mean, before you write that email, Give me a call um, I, at the last slide. Michael will be sharing my number. I'll talk you off the ledge because we really don't want to ruin that. So I'm going to send this back over to Michael for this next slide. Oh, great. I get to do the sales stuff. Ah. Anyway, <laughs> what you've got now is the precursor to life in the fast lane in government procurement. Eileen's been doing this. I'm not going to say how many years because that will give away her age. <laughs> I've been doing it 33 years in August. Back, well, I'm not supposed to do political jokes, but anyway, back nope. before you know who invented the you know what. And uh, 1986, and you can read all about both of us, uh, on, especially on my website. But Building Blocks of a Winning Proposal is a program that Eileen created a number of years ago number of years ago was like five, I believe, maybe more than that. I can't remember yeah. half the dates. I can't remember my name half the time. But anyway, <laughs> we are putting that into two two-hour sessions, strategy tools and templates. Now, if you go to the uh, webinar schedule, you'll see a link for that. This The one today will come down off the site as soon as we're finished. But we're offering you a $500 discount if you sign up by midnight tonight for the upcoming uh, next, be actually next Wednesday, one to five. And I've seen the documentation on this. And then I realized how much I didn't know because I've been out of the open market procurement arena 
for many, many years. I've concentrated strictly on GSA. I help them, help them with kind of different things with SAM and e-offer and, and that whole routine. But of course, they never listen. They just say, what do you think? And you tell them and they say, thank you very much. And they go away. So that's fine. But at least they ask. So take the time. EB1, that's short for early bird one, EB1 will get you $500 off. If you have multiple locations across the country, it's based on the IP address. We have significant discounts for multiple seats based on seats. Just take a look at it when you uh, when you click on it. And it's uh, quick and easy and you'll get registered. And we're going to have some fun. Uh, by the way, there are a couple breaks. I'd like to see them every hour, but there, you know, there's a break every uh, every couple hours to uh, get us through this thing. I just hope I can make it from break to break. So, anyway, with that in mind, take a look at the uh, sign up on our website, which you'll see in the next coming couple coming slides exactly. Or when you've got your slides, which you're hopefully you're downloading click on book it and it'll take you right there. You don't even have to go looking for it. And I can walk you through just a real quick, Mike, if you can take it back aside real quick, um, if that's possible, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be covering. It's there. We're going to be covering the strategy in the first section of the program. We're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about contract vehicles, RFP versus RFQs. So even though Mike, you've done GSA schedules, um, GSA still sometimes for services, especially they need requests for quotes. So these tools and templates can be used for that. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about strategy, bid, no bid, win themes. We're also going to talk about deconstructing the RFP, the process of doing that, um, how to build a, um, uh, a, um, technical doc documentation. We've got some great tools for that. Um, executive summaries, your your schedule for that. There's a lot that we're going to cover. And the goal here is to save you time when it's time to write that proposal so we can get you organized. What's going to be in your library ready to go? Um, we're going to talk about management plan content as well. And um, again, provide you with ways the professionals in proposal writing have been doing this a long time. You're going to learn all the tools and tricks to speed up the process and have templates to go with it. So I'm not going to go further about it, but it's a really great class. It helped me build a roofing team. I had a team of 48 uh, locations, and I had one proposal writer. She had to write all the proposals for 48 locations. We used the tools and templates from this class to um, build that team, and we captured $65 million in 18 months. So she, we were able to utilize the tools and templates to work on only the proposals that we were winners on. Um, so hopefully we can be able to get your team standing up and knowing how to write a proposal as well. Perfect. Here's some contact info. And uh, looking at this now, I think I probably should have not had the phone numbers in white. But that's beside the point. It should have been dark blue and, and bolded. Anyway, the, uh, the time has come when we're going to have to... Uh, part ways and here's our contacts hopefully everybody has gotten the handout uh, if you don't see handouts on your control panel go up to view and make sure there's a check mark next to handout and if you still don't get them or for some reason your firewall won't let you get them send uh, send an email to either one of us we'll make sure you get it and uh, we'll go on from there so if there's no other questions uh, looking here, I don't see any chats. I don't see any questions. It looks like we're clean, which means either we didn't explain it well enough or we explained it too well. My guess is, and hope is that we explained it too well. So, Eileen, anything you, you want to throw in at the end? All I can say is I really appreciate you taking 45 minutes of your time to go through this class. It's a very simple set of do's and don'ts, but sometimes people, one of those little don'ts can really send you down a rabbit hole. There's a lot more don'ts that we could be not doing, and there's a lot of do's we could be doing, 
Um, and hopefully down the road we can work together or talk with one another or connect with one another and see what your situation is and see how we can help you. But thank you again, Michael, for having me today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And hopefully if you have any questions, you've got our phone numbers. We're both on LinkedIn as well. Please connect with us. And we look forward to helping you down the road. Best of luck to you in Q4 2019. And uh, Let's go get them. Get on the phone and go close those deals. Make your Sherpa proud. Thank you all for showing up. And uh, we'll have the uh, replay up on uh, our website, which we'll load it right off of YouTube as soon as we possibly can. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for our next webinar.